on to the next topic is uh, bringing the brightest light to shadow inventory. Um, so let's talk about shadow inventory. What is it? Why do we care about it? Um, so the first thing that you need to know is that shadow inventory um, means that the bank has closed on the owner and the bank has taken possession of the property. That's what shadow inventory is. And it's technically um, not available for sale. Uh, so let's just quickly summarize uh, how the bank takes the property away from the owner. Um, so in Illinois, um, we have a judicial process because Illinois is a judicial state. So in the United States, you have judicial and non-judicial. So what it means is that um, banks have to go to the, through the court system to foreclose on the owner. That is why it's a judicial state and that process can take up to two years. So yes, the bank can take up to two years before they can uh, repossess the property from the owner. So just what happens before the bank um, takes possession of the property? So there was an agreement for the owner to pay the mortgage. For whatever reason, the owner fell behind, right? So at that point, uh, three or four months are gonna go by and then the bank is gonna go through the court system to file a lawsuit against the owner, okay? So officially the owner is gonna be in pre foreclosure And then the owner is given time to catch up, to concur with the payments. But if that doesn't happen, uh, uh, in six, to, six months to a year, then uh, since the case is in the court system, the judge is going to issue the auction date. They call it the notice of trustee sale. That means that it's 100% official, the owner is in foreclosure. So we have a date that the property is going to get auctioned off at the courthouse, okay? And you're gonna hear many terms, uh, such as sheriff sale, trustee sale, uh, judicial sale, auction. So that, that all happens, to, it's, it all means the same, and that happens at the courthouse in the county where the property belongs to, okay? Um, and then at that point, that's the place where you as investor do not wanna be, right? Because it's too risky to show up at the auction. That's like a shark tank. Think of it as a shark tank, right? Uh, because investors are gonna be bidding against each other. You buy property sight unseen, not only that, but you have to pay cash. So a lot of people have lost a lot of um, money doing that. So the next step is let's assume in, uh, let's assume that at the auction, at the judicial auction, nobody buys the property, right? So at that point, then the bank will take over the property. So that that's what's called shadow inventory. Okay. Now, the bank is not in the business of real estate, so the bank needs to dispose of the property. So they need to unload the property from their books. So the bank is gonna do one, or, one of two things. Number one, they're gonna give it to an REO broker uh, who's gonna put it on the MLS. And the second option is that um, they send it to the auctioning platforms. Uh, the two biggest ones are auction.com and hubzoo.com, okay? Uh, so that's what's going to happen because the bank is going to dispose of those properties, I would say, within the first 60 days, okay? So, friends, uh, it is, there's a secret to, to go after shadow inventory. Uh, so we have those properties in the system. So the, the way we like to find them is or access them by searching for all the properties that became shadow inventory in the last two months. Why two months? Because we want to uh, be able to buy the properties, right? If you look for a property that became shadow inventory maybe six months ago, the likelihood is that that property has already probably been sold to a third party, okay, via the MLS or it went to the <clears throat> auctioning platform. So we might be too late in the game. So therefore, it is safe to go as far as, we've gone as far as like three months back, but we typically like to stay within the last 60 days. So we wanna find out all the properties that went um, to the bank in the last 60 days, okay? So now, 
I was talking to one of the, uh, our members, um, Carlos. So Carlos called me, he said, hey, you know, Hugo, um, I'm interested in this property in um, Streamwood. I think it'll be a great rental. Uh, so he said, uh, I think we should get it. I said, yeah, of course, totally, it makes sense. So what we did is we ran the numbers. Uh, first of all, we, we found the property in Chicago Deal Vault, okay? Because we needed to understand uh, the background of the property. Not only that, but we need to do a quick analysis on the property to make sure that it makes sense, right? Either to buy and hold, fix and flip, or, or wholesale for that, for that case. So what we did is um, we went on the system, we found the property, uh, we noticed that the bank had already taken over. Um, and then the next thing that we did was to look for the property um, online to see if the bank had already posted the property online um, in the auctioning platforms. And indeed, that property had already gone to auction.com okay so we run the numbers which i'm about to show you what the numbers look like on that property and how you find them so let's just dive into it okay so here i'm going to uh open up chicago deal vault we're gonna close some of these tabs okay awesome so here I'm going to open up uh, shadow inventory. So you're going to go on their off market properties and then uh, you're going to click on bank tone shadow inventory. Okay. And then what we did is this property was in Streamwood, right? So the first thing, so I'm going to take you step by step. What is it that uh, we did on this property? So when somebody says, okay, the property is located in a given area. So the first thing that you need to know is you need to understand the area, right? Like the back of your hand. So what we did is, first of all, we just want to make sure that it's, uh, we like to focus or do deals on a BC area, right? So we, start, we stay away from D areas or A areas, okay? So at this point, so I'm going to look for Streamwood. Okay, here we go, Streamwood. So Streamwood is uh, west of Schaumburg and um, it is east of uh, Elgin, okay? So the first thing that we want to know is what type of area is this, right? So we want to find out uh, right here. So let me maximize this screen right here. Uh, okay, the report. Perfect. So right here, I'm maximizing the report. And then at this point, we're going to see the geographic location, okay? So make, making sure that uh, we identify any potential factors that are going to affect the property values, such as highways, cemeteries, um, airports, busy streets, or all of these, right? Uh, fortunately, we didn't see any, any of that right here. So uh, the next thing is that we look at the livability score. So at this point, the livability score is 74. Remember, we've talked, uh, we covered this before. Anything that is over 75, it's a great area. So this is in the borderline, okay? So as you can see in the summary, it looks, it looks pretty good, right? So amenities, cost of living, crime, education, employment is the only one that it's a D. So what that tells you is that there are not too many employers in, uh, in extreme moods. So source of employment is not that great. But other than that, you know, crime is slow. The heat map for the crime is clean. Schools are good. You see black markers. Otherwise, you see them uh, different color. Uh, and then let me <coughs> scroll down. So here, okay, look at this. Household income, 72,000 is uh, above the average in Illinois, 57,000. So that's a great thing. Population, look at this. It's growing, right? So we have 12% population growth, uh, which is awesome, right? So we don't want to be in areas where... Uh, population growth is negative, right? Where people are moving away. Why? Because your property values are going to decrease. Your vacancies are going to go up. Where, whereas areas where population are moving into, that means that property values, appreciation is going to go higher. Vacancies are going to be low. Uh, so that is a very critical uh, point that you need to understand. The industry, this is what uh, the breakdown of the employers, okay? So we're going to skip that for now. Then housing 
occupancy. One of the things that I, we like to look at it, if the property, let's say, is going to be for rental, we want to check that the vacancy rate is low, below 10%. In this case, vacancy is uh, about five, 488, which is great. Now check something out. Owner occupancy in the stream with it's 81%. So the higher the owner occupancy, the higher the pride of ownership. So that is great because uh, you have less renters. In this case, it's only 13% of renters. So that is really great. Okay, so for buy and hold or doing a fix and flip, that's gonna be awesome. Uh, so we rate the area. This is a B area. Uh, so again, we're going to be focusing on properties that are in B, C. That's it. D are like war zones, right? Where other people think that your car is their car. We stay away from those. Your safety is at risk, so we don't go into those areas. And then the A areas, they're a little bit riskier because... Uh, if you try to do a flip and then it doesn't work out, your holding expenses are going to be very high. Your rehab costs are going to be very high because the area demands that, right? And not only that, but for a buy and hold, uh, most likely the rents are not going to cover your expense, okay? So here we recommend a cash flow approach in um, Curl Stream, I mean in Streamwood. And then if we're going to do a, a buy a property, we need... We need to understand what's the sweet spot to buy a single family home. So here for, the, I want to know what's the, the most we should pay for a single family home. So we need to pay uh, less than 189 for the property, okay? And then if we do a buy and hold, it's going to stay in the market for a little bit over two months. And then uh, there are a few flips going on in the last 12 months. Now, the next thing that we need to know, so keep this number in mind, right? So we need to pay less than, 190 for a single family home in uh, stream room. Um, in curly stream, sorry. And then the rental market. So the rental market, we want to know what the rents are. So a uh, two bedroom can rent for 1400, a uh, three bedroom can go for 1650. So rents are high. And then we tell you how long they're going to stay in the market. So they're going to stay in the market for about a month and a half. Okay. So overall, everything looks good. Now, let's look at the property, right? So now we're gonna go on the off-market and then shadow inventory. So in here, what we're gonna do is exactly what I show you. So in this case, the area that we're looking into is um, Streamwood, okay? So now Streamwood, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back 60 days, right? So we want to find out all the properties that became shadow inventory in the last two months. So in here, so May, today is May 15th. So we're going to go back April, March. I'm going to go March 1st. Okay. And then uh, today is the 15th. Okay. So now let's find those properties. Okay. So let's see how many we find in here so we found three properties okay uh in here we have uh the subject property that we're going to be talking about so the subject property is 126 seton okay so now now we have this property we know it's in a in a great area it's in a b area we know the rental market is strong so the next thing we need to know first thing is uh, look at the location, right? Uh, so we want to make sure it's not near like a cemetery, a busy street, a highway, airport, and so forth. So the area, uh, if I just zoom in, it looks okay. So I'm going to um, click on a street view right here. Uh, so we just want to make sure that uh, everything looks okay. Okay, so that is the neighbor. This is the subject property. Okay, we're looking at it right now. So it's in front of us. So it's on a uh, dead end. Okay, call the sack. So it's good. So the, the neighborhood looks good. Okay, so this is, uh, that's the neighbor. This is the property. You can tell there's something that stands out. And, and the fact that it has a one car garage right here, and then plus it has an attached uh, two car garage. So you have a three car garage on this property. So now the next thing that you need to know is how much 
can we sell this property for after we've done the rehab, right? So what's the after repair value on the property? So what we need to do is find out uh, all the properties that sold in the last six months within a one mile radius that are comparable, okay? So how do we do that? So first of all, what's the subject property? It's a three bedroom, one bath, uh, 1181 square feet, right? So uh, to find out what the after repair value on the property, it is very simple, friends. All you need to do is scroll down, okay? And in here, we are going to click on search, okay? So you don't need to change anything. So we're taking into account the same um, parameters of the subject property. It's a three bedroom, one bath. So we're looking for properties that sold right here in the last six months within a one mile radius, okay? So once we get the response back um, in a few seconds, then we're gonna need to remove the outliers. So what we mean is we need to remove Whoa, we've got a lot of properties, right? So we're gonna need to remove the properties that are short sale, the properties that are distressed, because they're not gonna be comps. We're looking for comps that have been rehabbed, right? Properties that um, the work has been done. So as you can see, there are some right here, like 135, 150. So those properties, if I just click on them, they're distressed properties. And as you can see, there's only one picture on the property, but if I just click on the details, um, so sold that C. So this is a short sale. So this is not a comp, right? Uh, we don't wanna comp, uh, use a comp that is a distressed property that no, nothing has been done to the property. So we're gonna skip this property altogether. Uh, as you can see, the price range, they go in the upper, um, lower 200s, upper 100s. So anything that is low, I'm gonna remove, like the 130, 160, 140, uh, 164, all of these are most likely distressed, right? So now, once I remove those properties, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna scroll up to the top, and then I'm gonna toggle back to the map view right here. So boom, so we have all these comps that are within a one mile radius, and then we updated, uh, we updated the ARV. So we can safely say that once we do the repairs on this property, we can sell this property for uh, 200,000. Okay, so that is the first thing that you need to do. Now, the next thing that you need to know is before you waste any time is how much can I offer for this property, right? And it is very simple, friends. Before I share this with you, uh, we have a couple of shortcuts to do that. I call them rule of thumbs, right? So I'm gonna pull up my calculator. Um, we can obviously do a more detailed analysis because we have the rental and the flip calculator in the system down below. But just for quick analysis, you don't need any spreadsheet. You don't need any software. All you need is uh, a calculator, regular calculator to find out how much you can offer for this property. Uh, using the following rule of thumb. Okay, so we're gonna take 200,000. That's how much we can sell this property for. Now, I'm going to multiply these uh, by a multiplier. Now, that multiplier is going to depend whether we're gonna do a buy and hold or a fix and flip. Uh, based on this area, the rental marker is a strong, right? So we recommend a cash flow approach. Why? Because the rents are high, okay? Um, that is the main reason why Streamwood, it's a great area for uh, buy and hold. Okay, so for that matter, I'm gonna multiply 200 times 80%, okay? So what is 80%? 80% is you account for a 10% profit or equity in the deal when you buy the property at least, and then a 10% for closing expenses, okay? And current costs. So that is when we multiply that by 0.80 or 80%. Now, to this number, we need to subtract the uh, rehab. Now, how do we compute the rehab without looking at the property? Um, to do that, in here, we give you the rehab estimate uh, in the system. So we say that rehab is gonna be between 14,000 to 21,000. Uh, 
but the way we compute this, this is fairly accurate. This is based on the square footage, the size of the property, and the location, Streamwood. Uh, but if you don't have that available to you, I'm going to show you a trick how you can compute that. This only applies for uh, properties in a B, C area. Okay, it does not apply to properties that are in a D area or A area. So you're going to take the square footage and multiply that by two. So if we have uh, 1,100 square feet, we're going to multiply that by two. So actually, it's going to be almost uh, 1,200 times two. So it's going to be minus 24. Okay. So the most we can offer in this property is somewhere in the 136 to, I would say between 136 to 139, okay? That's the most we can offer on this property, okay? So now once that's clear, but obviously we've got to see the property from the inside. Why? Because it may just require a cosmetic rehab, which is to your advantage, but it might be a good rehab, right? And then that's gonna throw the numbers. So this uh, formula of multiplying the square footage times two is not gonna work. This only works for uh, busy areas and if the rehab is light to medium, but if it's a good rehab, it's not gonna work, right? So for a good rehab, you can spend up to, for this square, square footage, you can spend up to 50, 60, 70, right? Depending whether you need to do roof, mechanicals, windows. Um, okay, so, but for now, just to keep it simple, uh, the most we can offer on this property is 136. Okay, now let's look at what's going on with this property. So the first thing that you need to know is um, the, when it went back to the bank. So the auction happened in uh, March 7th. Now the starting bid was 135. Okay, and the ending bid was 135. So nobody bought it for 135. But based on the numbers that I gave you, if the property doesn't require a go rehab, it makes sense to pay between 136 to 139 for this property. Okay, now let me scroll down and check this out. The owner had an outstanding balance of 160,000. So, what does that tell you? That the bank was going to take a hit, right? Because uh, the bank was going to sell the property, perhaps, right? If, if somebody had offered 135,000 uh, for the property, because that was the starting bid. Uh, but in this case, you know, the, the bank took a big hit on the property. So the bank is going to try to sell this property for at least this amount, okay? Because that was the starting bid for at least this amount. But keep in mind that the bank is going to be shooting for. 160,000 on this property. So once you have that, the next thing that you need to understand is who the uh, plaintiff is or the bank is. So in this case is SLS. Okay, so that's a fairly, fairly large bank. Um, so at this point, you have two options. Uh, to reach out to the attorney to find out if, um, we can make an offer directly through the through their attorney, through the bank's attorney, or if they can give you the asset manager uh, phone number. However, keep in mind that if this is a large bank, most likely they're not gonna give you the asset manager's contact information, right? Because these banks have a large foreclosure department and they wanna move properties in bulk, right? So they're not gonna sell you one or two to you or me. They wanna sell or move these properties in bulk. So what these properties are going to do is they are going to send these properties to the auctioning platforms, okay? So the next thing that you need to do is look for this property in Google. So that's what I'm gonna do next. Okay, so here I'm gonna open up a new browser window and then I'm just gonna quickly property but what i'm looking at is i'm looking for the bigger uh, auctioning platforms right like hubzoo uh hubzoo and then um, auction.com so i'm gonna scroll down so this is zillow refin i don't care about that trulia i don't care about that realtor i don't care about that boom auction.com so what does that tell you that tells you that the bank took the property back in march and they didn't waste uh, much time, right? So 
again, they're going to move the property either to the MLS or to the auction platforms within 60 days. Again, why? Because they're not in the business of uh, real estate. Banks are in the business of lending. So they want to dispose of the property. So this is the property. So when I click on the property, uh, let me just click on the property right here. So we're going to uh, open up auction.com. And then one of the questions, um, okay, so this is the property. Okay, so I'll show you the details. So it says that auction.com estimates the value on this property to be 222, okay? Uh, we did our CMA very quickly, and I believe uh, it can be sold fast for 200,000. Um, I mean, it could potentially be sold for higher. It all depends on the rehab um, that we do on the property, okay? If we were to do a flip. So now, um, in this case, what we need to do next, once we, are done, once we know the property is in auction.com, then uh, we can start the bidding on this property, right? So you're gonna log in onto, you need to create an account uh, in auction.com and they're gonna request your uh, credit card. So they're gonna put a hold on your credit card for 2,500, okay? That is in case that you win the, the, the bid and do, um, if you back out of the, the deal or you breach the contract, then they can get to keep that 2,500, okay? So keep that in mind. So now at this point, uh, we are here in auction.com. So if we're gonna start the bidding, on this property, we need to know that the most we can pay for this property is between 136 to 139, okay? I'm gonna make a parenthesis because somebody asked, what happens if we have liens on this property? So as you can see, there's a lien on the property for 104,000. But at this point, these liens uh, disappear once they are shadow uh, inventory, shadow properties. Uh, because the bank has already taken possession of the property. So you don't need to worry about this lien. Okay, so let's go back to the, to the subject property in auction.com. So let me tell you right off the bat what you need to understand before buying the property from the auctioning platforms. I'm going to tell you the mistakes that people make. They start the bidding war without knowing what the max allowed offers should be. In this case, that was the first thing that we know, right? This is the first thing that we computed, 136 to 139, okay? So if you're gonna, that's one of the mistakes that a lot of people make, okay? So somebody's saying that the auction ended in April. Yes, the auction ended in April. Uh, I'm gonna get to that in just a second, okay? Uh, because uh, we got the property on the contract, that is why. So we were the winning bid on this property. So that is why the, this occurred uh, in April 3rd, okay? But we, we were the winning bid. But I just wanna show you the process, okay? And then I'm gonna show you how the bidding occurred, how it happened. So in this case, mistake number one that people make is not knowing what's your max offer on the property, right? So but that was the first thing that we computed. We should not pay more than 136 to 139, okay? Now, the second mistake that people make is uh, uh, lack of due diligence, right? So when you're gonna make an offer or bid on a property through these platforms, you need to do your due diligence. So what does that mean? You've gotta drive by the property. You've gotta try to see the property from the inside. Uh, or access the property from the inside, drive around the neighborhood, um, identify factors that are gonna affect the property value, like close to highways, close to busy roads, cemeteries, airplanes, I mean, airports, and so forth, right? Um, but so far, when we did the map, we already did the map on this, and it looks good, right? Uh, so the next thing is that you've gotta go inside the property if possible. Now, let me show you in here, uh, so we have the details of the property, but this is what's really important on the property. Uh, interior access, no. So no interior access. So what do you do in these cases? You've got to pick through the windows, okay? You've got to do your due diligence, uh, try to see what the condition of the inside is like, right? So 
uh, you just want to verify that the property is not a good rehab, right? That it doesn't have walls, that it at least has kitchen cabinets that you can speak through, right? And be able to see as much as you can, right? See the condition of the roof um, and so forth. Things that you can see from the outside. Um, now here, they have a buyer's premium. This is how the auctioning platforms make money, right? Uh, so this is paid by the buyer, in this case, you. So you're going to pay at least 2,500 or 5% of the, of the winning bid. Okay, so keep that in mind because we need to add that on to the price. So what does that mean? Um, so 5% of this amount is how much? It's about 6,800, right? So think of this. 6,800, that's gonna be the buyer's premium. So we said we can pay up to 139 minus the buyer's premium, okay? So if we're gonna start the bidding war, we should not pay more than 132,000 for the property because I'm taking into account the buyer's premium, right? Because we have to pay for that. So we need to factor that in, okay? So the most we can, offer in the bidding war is 132,000. I know that for a fact. Now, financing, this is another thing that uh, makes people lose their uh, security deposit or earnest money, right? So he's, here it says cash only, but within here, this means that you cannot finance this through a conventional lender. So if you wanna get, let's say, uh, Homebridge or Chase or Bank of America, all these conventional lenders, they will not allow you to use conventional lending. Why? Because conventional lenders need to get inside the property, number one. They need to have all the utilities on, okay? Now, when you're dealing with uh, this type of property, you've got to either pay cash or you can also use a hard money lender, okay? Because the Harmony lender will not necessarily need to go inside the property, okay? They might be able to do a desktop appraisal, so they don't need to go inside the property. Again, uh, many <coughs> require also an inspection of the property, okay? Um, and also, one of the cool things is that in this case, if you use a Harmony lender, you can close fairly fast on the transaction, okay? And then Harmony lenders do not expect to have all the utilities on because auction properties, uh, for instance, the water is gonna be off, right? It's winterized. So the bank is not going to turn on the water because the bank would need to pay the village to turn that on just for an inspection. That's not gonna, that's not gonna happen. So Harmony lenders understand that. So they will not uh, require all utilities, all utilities to be on. Um, Whereas conventional lenders will, right? Because let's say if you turn on the, the water and then all the pipes are broken, the rehab is going to be a lot greater, right? So they're more conservative, whereas Harmony lenders, they're less um, strict. However, obviously you're going to pay for it, right? Because the interest rate is going to be a lot higher. Okay, so what are the, what are the, the terms of, uh, that's a question that, that somebody asked. What are the terms of the Harmony lenders? So you're gonna be paying uh, over 12% interest rate between 12 up to, I've seen up to 18%. You're gonna be paying about two points. So two points, let's say if the loan is for 100,000, two points is 2,000, right? So that is just origination fees and uh, that's how the, the banks, the Harmony lenders make money. You can also use a private money lender. Okay, in Chicago Dealable, we have private money lenders. So these are, uh, passive investors who do not wish to be active, right, buying deals, but they have money and they're okay making 10% on, on their money. So we have those in the system. That's another way that you can finance the property. So now we know what it takes to, to, to get into this game, right? So we already have the uh, funding aligned because through Chicago Deal Vault, we have access to Harmony lenders and we have access to private money lenders. So we have that line up, okay? So all we need to do is ensure that we get the property for the right price. In this case, we should not pay more than 
132,000. Okay, all good so far? Okay, so now let's see what happened, right? So what I did is I logged on to the um, auction.com at that day, and then let's see what happened. So the next thing that um, you need to know is you don't want to start the bidding until the auction is just about to end. So look at this, uh, look at the bottom section right here. So the current bid is 108, 888. And then there is still 22 minutes remaining. So you don't want to start the, the bidding uh, when you have 22 minutes remaining. You want to bid in the last 30 seconds. You heard me right, friends. You want to be on the last 30 seconds, okay? So then, let me show you what happened next. So the next thing is, look at the jump. Now, the, the current bid is 118,000, but there are only two minutes left and 38 seconds, okay, for the bidding. So at this point, guess what? I'm, I'm not bidding yet, okay? So let's go to the next one. So now it jumped up to $121,888, and there's one minute and 38 seconds remaining. Okay, so still, right? So we're just monitoring, and, and this keeps going up. But remember, the most we can pay for the, the property is 132. So if it starts to go higher than, than 132, uh, we're not going to do anything on it, right? Because the numbers are not going to work for the rental, okay? Next, it went up to 125,888, okay? And there's one minute and 25 seconds remaining. So why does this keep increasing? So um, they have auction.com and many of the auction platforms, they have what's called a proxy bidder. Okay, so it's an automated way for them to raise up the bid, right? So it doesn't mean that there's an actual individual or investor bidding. You can just be bidding against the proxy bidder, which is auction.com's system, right? To just jack up the price, believe it or not. So the way it works is when somebody bids and then the increments are, I believe, in the thousand. So when somebody increments, the bid by a thousand, then auction.com is gonna extend the bidding by, I believe, two minutes. Okay, so now we're at 125, 888. So the next thing is check this out. Current bid is at 128,000. Okay, now bid increment is in the thousand. So it says, it's asking me, you are ready to bid, the reserve is met. So this is so critical. What does that mean, the reserve is met? Remember that the starting bid at the, at the judicial sale was 135,000. So that was like the, the reserve, right, for the bank. In this case, the reserve for the bank seemed to have gone down uh, from 135 to 128. So it's asking me, are you sure you want to bid? Right, so it's asking me if I want to increase the bid by one thousand and offer one hundred and twenty-nine thousand eight hundred and eighty-eight dollars. Look at this: bidding ends in twelve seconds. Yes, look at this screen carefully. Okay, so the last bid is one twenty-eight, and it's asking me: Do you want to up that by a thousand dollars and offer one hundred and twenty-nine eight hundred and eighty-eight? Okay, there are twelve seconds remaining so the reserve has been met if i don't offer 129 888 dollars guess what the the person who offered 128 is going to get the property yes he's going to get the property why because the reserve has been met so at this point what that means is the bank has what it needs right the reserve has been met for the bank. <clears throat> so as you remember, we came up with 132,000, right? That's the most. So what do you think uh, I did? Do you think I click on confirm bid? Confirm bid, yes or no? Of course, yes. It's a no-brainer, right? So I still have a margin. We can offer up to 132,000. 
So what I did next is I obviously clicked on confirm bed. This is from confirm bid. This is from my, I was doing this from my cell phone. So the next thing is that current bid is, look at this. So I made the offer for, let me just back it up. So I made the offer for 129,888, okay? Uh, in the last 10 seconds, okay? Because otherwise we would lose the property. Uh, this other individual would get the property and then the numbers would work for them. So we made the offer, so we were at 129, and then guess what happened? Somebody offered 130, uh, it was 129, so somebody offered a thousand more, so that would be 130, right? 130,888. So now, what I did is 130,888. So again, it asked me, do you want to make a bid? Do you want to up that by a thousand? I said yes, because remember, the max we can offer is 132,000. So I made the offer for $131,888. And that was gonna be my last offer. Why? Because I we wouldn't be able to go a penny more. Why? Because the numbers would not work. I don't care about the frenziness that I'm running or all the adrenaline that I'm having on this property. This is like blackjack, right? You've got to know when you need to quit because if you don't, you're gonna lose money, right? It's like, it is, they're just rules, right? When you double down, when you hit, when you hold on, on the cards, right? When you're playing blackjack, this is exactly the same thing. You need to know when, when to quit. So we knew that was gonna be our last bid. If somebody overbid this, uh, God bless them, right? Hopefully they're gonna make their money, but we will not risk it. So the next thing was, that uh let me see move this screen over here so here it says ending bid was 131,888 okay there is a question where do you see the reserve price okay so Paresh, the reserve price it's on the screenshot that i show before right here so it says current bid 128,888. And then right below, when it says you're ready to bid, it says the reserve is met, right? So that means that the bank could sell this for 128. So we offer 13188, and then the ending bid was 131,888. So the auction ended. And the next thing that you get is an email, right? It says you are the highest bidder for and then the property address. So the highest bid was 131,888. Okay, so we won the bid and we stayed within our max allowed offer, 132,000. So if I show you on the dashboard, right? So here, this is the property. So remember, this was the winning bid, but the buyer's premium, right? Remember that it's 5%. So 5% of this amount, it is this much, 6,594. So the final purchase price will be 138,482. Remember our numbers, the most we could pay for this property, it was plus 6.8. The most we could pay for this property was 139. So we were just right there. Uh, <clears throat> so now the, uh, the property. Now the question is, what do you do with the property? So ideally, you want to you want to be able to do a buy and hold, right, or a wholesale on the property. At this point, the numbers would not work for a flip. Okay, let me tell you. Let me repeat this. The numbers would not work for a flip, even if we can sell this property for uh, five. So I believe this property is worth two hundred thousand. Even though auction.com says that it's worth 220, uh, I believe uh, I like to be conservative. Um, I believe this could be sold easily for 200,000. Now the question is, why would this not work for a flip? I'm going to tell you why. Because our ARV after repair is 200,000. I'm going to do the uh, max allowed offer for flip. Okay? So we're going to multiply that times 
70% instead of 80%, right? So the ratios change for a flip. Why 70%? Because we need to account 20% is going to be our profit at least. And then 10% is going to be for carrying costs and closing costs. So that is why you've got to multiply these by 0.70 minus the rehab. So the rehab we said is going to be the square footage, which is almost 1,200 times 2, 24,000. 24, so I'm going to do uh, 25,000. So for a flip, we needed to pay no more than 115. Otherwise, it just doesn't make sense, right? So if we wanted to do a flip and we're going to put 25,000 into the property, you should not pay more than 115,000 for this property. So if we're going to get this property for 138,000, the only, we have two options. We can either do a wholesale or a buy and hold. Now it makes sense to do a buy and hold. Why? Because the rents are high in, in Streamwood. And uh, we recommend in the area report, a buy and hold, a cash flow approach, right? We can also do a wholesale, do nothing to the property and then make, um, uh, about 10,000 on the property at least and do nothing. So that's another option, right? To wholesale this property easily, right? Um, but again, whoever you wholesale this property is not able to flip. Why? Because there's not enough meat in the bone, right? They, they, they would have needed to pay no more than 115,000 for this deal to make sense for a flip. So this deal makes sense only for a wholesale, wholesale or a buy and hold, okay? given the numbers. So as you, as you can tell, I'm showing you the tricks, how you can think, work, act as a pro investor, okay? I didn't, I didn't need any other tools besides the calculator. But obviously, uh, what I did uh, before I jump into auction.com, just for sanity, I <clears throat> used the uh, rental calculator. So let me show you um, how it works. Very simple, you've seen this before, but I just want you to see the numbers, what they look like. Uh, so in this case, the rent on this property is gonna be 1,700. Okay, now utilities are gonna be paid by the tenant, and then maintenance, uh, let's assume it's gonna be maybe $7,500, uh, $75 a month. Management fee, we can manage this property. Now, why? Are we going to manage this property? Because when we rehab these properties, we pretty much end up doing most of the work, like flooring, painting, kitchens, and bath. So most likely, it's not going to cause many maintenance issues. That is why we you can safely take on the management of this property. Okay, but if the property is old, you haven't upgraded the property, then it's a good idea to to delegate the headaches of dealing with the tenants to a property management, okay? And in Chicago Deal Vault, uh, our preferred partner is Secure Pay One. They're, they're awesome, okay? Because you, um, they get to use your contractors, which we love, right? We, we like to use our contractors for the maintenance because otherwise that's how property management companies make a lot of money. They charge you an arm and a leg for their contracting work and we don't like that. So that is why we, we promote secure pay one that's for investors and was created by investors okay so management fee zero insurance is going to be about 70 75 for this property now taxes to find out what the taxes are remember just click on owner loan tab this is where the public records are and then i'm going to scroll down to the bottom okay and then at the bottom of it uh, we're going to see the taxes 47 24 so I'm going to divide that 47.24 by 12. I want to see the monthly taxes are going to be 393. Okay, so in here, go back to the rental calculator, 393, 393. Okay, now how much are we paying for the property? Let me, we're paying 138. Well, let's make it 138.500, just for simplicity, 138. Eight five hundred. The rehab is going to be twenty five thousand. One two three. For labor, it's going to be like thirteen thousand. So what we typically like to do is double that. Uh, this is just based on experience. Uh, so once you know the labor, just double that. So but it's in the ballpark. So twenty five thousand, and then we're going to click on calculate, 
Uh, so in here, the positive cash flow on this on this property will be about five sixty two. Um, therefore, we we highly recommend the Streamwood for a cash flow approach, right? Because the rents are high, so the numbers are going to great work amazing. So we like to target when we do rentals. We would like to have at least 400 in positive cash flow. Okay, after all the expenses are paid off by the by the by the rent, uh, we like to cash flow at least 400. So this is obviously a home run deal for a cash flow. Uh, if we stick to the rehab of uh, 25,000, now uh, let me show you this. This is so crucial. I like to emphasize this: uh, the debt coverage ratio, right? Because this tells me if the deal is gonna get funded. So banks are looking for 1.2 and above. So let me just quickly tell you what that means. What that means is that the banks require you to make at least 20% more cash than what it's required to pay your uh, mortgage. That's what it means. So that's what the banks care about, uh, 1.2. So that means 20% more cash. So in this case, we're gonna have 94% more cash than what, it, than what it's required to pay the mortgage. So this will totally get funded by a harmony lender, like no questions asked. Okay, so that is the, the quick analysis that I did. But again, I knew that by paying this uh, money, no more than 140, the numbers would work very nicely. Okay, does that mean sense? Now, if, uh, do the, if we do the flip, the numbers I'm gonna show you, they're not going to work. Uh, as nice as you would expect. So the rehab, I'm gonna do 25,000 for the rehab, okay? And then uh, holding time, uh, it's gonna be at least four months, four to five months. So let's leave it at four months. Three months for the market time and then one month for the rehab. Then commission is gonna be 5%. Utilities, you're gonna pay gas, electric, water while you rehab the property. So this is gonna be about 140. Taxes, we said is 390. Three, uh, property cost. So we paid uh, one thirty-eight five hundred, and then let's click on calculate. Okay. So if I look at this net profit, twenty-three thousand. Um, so it is a lot of work that you're putting in because look at this. The whole time is four months. How did I come up with four months? Let me quickly show you how cool this is. Uh, when I go back to this, I can tell you how long this property is gonna stay in the market if we put it for sale. 73 days, so that is uh, two and a half months. And then the rehab is six weeks, so that's at least four months that the property is gonna stay in the market. So if you think about it, let me go back to the calculator. If you think about it, you're gonna be making only 23,000 in four months. So if you divide that by four, so 23,000, 23 divided by four. So it's not bad, but it's, it's, not the type, it's not the type of flip that we want to do. Because let me tell you, the rule of thumb is for um, every 100,000 of, of, of value in the property, you need to make at least 20% on the flip. So if the property, if you're gonna sell it for 200, you need to make at least 20% uh, profit on the flip. So we would be looking into the flip if we could net 40,000. But I knew upfront that by paying 138,000, we wouldn't net 40,000. We're gonna be netting only 23,000. So we are not willing to flip it, right? Why? Because it just doesn't make sense. There's not enough profit to spend four months, right? Uh, carrying the cost, um, putting the, the work for the rehab, just to make 23,000. So for that matter, friends, let's wholesale the, the stalker, right? So today we can wholesale the deal and then maybe make 10,000. So I'd rather make 10,000 today within, let's say, after closing, let's say you make, you, you wholesale the deal Within, within a month. So it's what's best to make 10,000 in one month or to make 23 in four to five months. It's a no brainer, right? So that is why this property is not a candidate for a flip, 
okay? Now, if you were to pay a lot less for the property, remember what I told you with the formula? Let's just run through the formula again. If you can sell it for 200, you're gonna multiply this by 70, that's 20% of your profit and 10% for current cost and uh, closing cost minus the rehab. So the most you can pay is 115. So now I'm gonna change this to 115 and see what the numbers look like. 115, one, two, three, and then uh, click on calculate. So the net profit, now we're talking friends. Now we're talking. So we would do this flip uh, like, not tomorrow. If we were to knit 48,000, we would do it. Why? Because check this out. If you divide 48,000 by four months or so, you're going to be making at least 10,000 a month. So it's a no brainer to flip the property if we had paid 115 for the property. But we didn't, we're not going to pay that much. We're going to pay a lot more. So the only strategy that makes sense for this deal is a buy and hold. So is this making sense, friends? How quickly? Remember, I came up with the numbers of the max allowed offer way before we dove into the flip and rental calculator. That's how pro investors think. We can analyze deals in seconds. I'm going to repeat that again. We analyze deals in seconds. So we know in one minute, friends, how much we should offer. In one minute, I'm gonna tell you. The way we do it, just to quickly summarize, in one minute, I can skim through the report to know what approach I need to do, how much I need to pay for our property, how long it's gonna stay in the market, how much the rents are gonna be. So I know that within a minute, less than a minute, in 30 seconds. And the next 30 seconds, I'm going to use them to find out what my ARV for the property is going to be. Remember, all you need to do is click on under the comps, just click on search and then remove the outliers. That's going to tell you your ARV of 200,000. So now the next step is I'm going to do the, the ARV in, uh, let's say, 10 seconds. Now the next 20 seconds I'm going to use to calculate my max allowed offer for a flip and a rental. So I used 30 seconds to find out everything about there is to know on Streamwood. So that's 30 seconds. I added another 10 seconds for the ARV, which is 201. So that's 40 seconds, okay? And then I'm gonna add 10 more seconds to come up with my max allowed offer for a buy and hold, which I'm gonna do again. So it's 200 times 70 minus the rehab, which is the square footage times two minus 25, so for a flip, that's my max allowed offer. Now for a rental is 200 times 80 minus the rehab. So for the rental, we shouldn't pay more than 135, 140 for, for, the, for a rental approach. So I literally took one minute, one minute, 60 seconds, friends, to analyze this deal. Does that make sense? So that's how you need to act on the deal. And then obviously once, you know, we jump on uh, auction.com, we know our max allowed offer, right? So we're not going to go beyond in this case was 132,000. Okay. We're not going to go beyond that. Um, and then obviously when this, the bidding started to happen, we knew we couldn't do a flip because the most we could pay for the property was 115,000 to make it work for a flip. But as I show you, on the uh, PowerPoint, even way before everything started, look at this, um, the, the bidding was over 118. So I knew that we couldn't do a flip on this property at this point. So my hope was, since this is a cash flow area, that we could still do the, the buy and hold, right? By not paying more than 132,000 for the property. Okay, which in this case, we met our criteria. So remember, uh, real estate, it's all about uh, speed, right? Understanding the shortcuts, how you can quickly analyze a deal successfully in less than one minute. I mean, it may sound ridiculous, friends, what I'm telling you, but that is how successful investors work. That's how Andrew does it. That's how Rahul does it. That's how Ryan Smith uh, does it. That's how we do it. We don't 
take more than a minute to analyze a deal. And I'm here to show you the secrets because I, I want to make sure that you are successful. I want to make sure that you join the, rack, the ranks of top investors. And this is how you do it. Okay. I want to make sure that you don't uh, make the mistakes of the novices. Okay. So friends, um, are there any further questions? Uh, because this concludes today's presentation on auctions. Okay. Are there any questions on the line uh, that I can answer? Okay, so uh, one question is, um, are you able to see the property from the inside? So we were not able to see the property from the inside. We peeked through the windows, but let me tell you something. When we walked through the property, uh, back window happened to be open, okay? So I didn't go inside the property myself, but I have um, our guy who is boots on the ground. Check it out. So we, we did see the, the property from the inside. I didn't personally, but uh, the, our guy boots on the ground did see the property from the inside. There, there was a window that happened to be open. So we were able to, to take a peek and, and check it out. So yes. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay, friends, uh, if there are no further questions, uh, let me just quickly, before we end tonight, summarize what we did. So we talked about shadow inventory. Okay, shadow inventory, those are the properties that are taken by the bank, okay, in the foreclosure process. So once the property went to the judicial auction at the courthouse and nobody bought it, it became the bank's asset. So the bank is not in the business of lending. They're gonna send the property to the REO broker, that will in turn put it in the MLS or to the auctioning platforms like auction.com, okay? Um, so at this point, you've got to run the numbers, right? If you're gonna be bidding on these platforms, you've got to know the numbers. So in one minute, friends, spend 30 seconds to analyze the area report, 10 seconds to get the ARV using Chicago Deal Vault or on their comps, another 10 seconds to compute your max allowed offer for a flip and another 10 seconds for your max allowed offer for a buy and hold okay does that make sense so within a minute you've got to know your numbers in case you're gonna do the bidding war okay and make sure you stick to your numbers right because if you do not you can lose money okay very easily and then uh, make sure you leverage from the harmony lenders that we have in chicago deal both on their preferred partners and then uh, also in the private money lenders, okay? Because those are the lenders that you wanna use to buy distressed properties or auction properties or shadow inventory or preferred closures. You wanna use harmony lenders. You should not use conventional lenders because they will deny the loan. They ask for too many requirements. They focus on your credit, on too many things that the property needs to have, right? It needs to be, in other words, in livable condition with all the utilities on. Right, so those are sort of like MLS properties, which we do not like because uh, like to target those. Why? Because they might be overpriced. Although we've found awesome deals from the MLS, but again, there are distressed properties on the MLS. So we use hard money lenders, private money lenders for them. Okay, uh, let me see another question. Um, Okay, so the, the question is, when we bid, did we get, uh, what's the question? Did you wait for until it got two seconds? Yes, so the question is, when did we make the bid? Okay, so let me, uh, I waited till the last minute, but as you can see here, look at this screenshot. It says below the 129, it says bidding ends in going once 12 seconds. So I made the last bid in the last 10 seconds before the auction was over. So friends, you're dealing with seconds, not minutes, seconds. You've got to make your final bid in the last 10 seconds. Actually, I've done in the last like five seconds. I, I like to push myself. So it's a lot of adrenaline, but friends, you've got to stick to your numbers. Make sure you, you do your numbers like the way I show you, like the pros, right? And you cannot go a penny over that. If you lose the property, God bless the winner, the winner of that property because uh, they're going to struggle making the numbers work. Okay, friends, so that concludes tonight's webinar. Stay tuned for um, 
next week's webinar. Oh, but before I let you go, friends, something really cool that I want to share with you. We have an awesome event uh, going, going on at uh, the Cicero property. So that's going to be this Sunday. Let me put it up on the screen so you, you can come. So this Sunday, you're going to get to know our contractors. So we're going to do, I think this is going to be a and hold or a flip. Uh, you guys are going to tell us what we're going to do. We're not sure yet in this property in Cicero. Okay, so the, you're going to get to meet our contractors. You're going to meet our staging company, landscapers. So it's going to be really cool. So we're going to have you come to the property uh, in Cicero. So 3858 South 61st Avenue in Cicero. Make sure you come. Uh, you're going to meet a lot of people. And as a bonus, we're going to do a speed networking event. So it's going to be really amazing make sure you do not miss this event this sunday at 1 p.m in cicero you're gonna see we've done the rehab of the property many of you went when we had bought the property and it was not rehab right so we brought uh, george hyatt our preferred inspector to show you what to look for right but now we've done all the work not only that but we've taken into account your recommendations many of you made a lot of awesome recommendations when you guys talk, we listen, not only for Chicago Deal Vault, but also for rehabs. So we made a lot of enhancements that you guys recommended. So you're going to see that, meet our contractors. It's going to be really cool. We're going to do a speak networking event and a raffle. So make sure you show up on Sunday, 1 p.m. Mark your calendar. So friends, thank you for joining tonight and stay tuned. See you Sunday and stay tuned for next uh, Mastermind. So thanks a lot. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Hugo. Thank you, everyone.